Hello and happy holidays. I want to welcome you to the AIRS webinar mini today and I'm so glad that you uh, gave yourself 15 minutes of this day to be here with me and spend some time chatting about holiday stress and stress solutions. I really think you'll be glad you did. Before we dig in, I just want to let you know that you'll be getting an email tomorrow with this recording attached. The email will also include links to the articles I used to create this content, as well as links to other resources on the AIRS Learning site that can provide further insight into this topic. We will also upload the video to our YouTube channel and share it through our social media links. So we are definitely a typically data-loving group, so we're actually going to start with some statistics. 62% of people describe their stress level as very or somewhat elevated during the holiday season. Uh, they worry about balancing work and holiday obligations, taking time off and returning to heavier workloads, having a smaller staff than usual because of time off, buying gifts for coworkers and contacts, and attending all office holiday parties. Um, another thing is that really more than any other income group, lower middle income families, which include a lot of nonprofit workers, feel that pressure of commercialism and hype during the holidays, and it creates expectations, which creates financial worries about being able to afford the holidays without skipping payments or running up credit card debt. It's also a season when we see both the very best and the very worst of other people. Calls and interactions with people who are sad, lonely, depressed, or experiencing really difficult life circumstances multiply. We spend a lot of emotional energy expressing that ever important empathy and lifting the burdens of each inquiry. It can take a toll on our own mental and emotional health. Today, for a few minutes, we're going to focus on tools and solutions that help us as helping professionals get through this time of year as unscathed as possible. So all of you have heard of the 12 days of Christmas, but instead of the 12 days of Christmas and all of those impractical gifts with birds and dozens of people uh, with drums and cows, the heirs team wants to give you something actually useful that you won't have to find room on a shelf for. So here's our gift to you, all of you, 12 ways to make the holidays bearable when you work in helping professions. So number one is to name your emotions. Fred Rogers once said, anything that's human is mentionable and anything that is mentionable can be more manageable. When we can talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting and less scary. At our best, we feel positive, happy, confident, calm, focused, enthusiastic, open, and optimistic. And that's when we're most productive and get along best with others. At our worst, we feel the opposite of those positive emotions, which is negativity, unhappiness, self-doubt, impatience, irritability, defensiveness, pessimism, and our sense of value feels at risk, our vision narrows, and our energy gets consumed in self-protection. The most prevalent unexpressed emotion in the workplace revolve around suffering. It's not that suffering is a modern phenomenon or that it's the only thing we feel at work. What seems to have changed is the pervasive impact of increased demands in our lives, leading to anxiety, uncertainty, and a sense of feeling overwhelmed. The answer to that is that naming our emotions tends to diffuse that charge and lessen the burden that they create. The psychologist Dan Segal refers to this practice as name it to tame it. It's also true that we can't change what we don't notice. Denying or avoiding feelings doesn't make them go away, nor does it lessen their impact on us, even if it's unconscious. Noticing and naming emotions gives us a chance to take a step back and make choices about what to do with them. Number two, attend to your injuries. So we're gonna go back just for a second. So I remember one holiday season working with a single mom with four kids and she had decided that she was gonna forego gifts for her family since she didn't have enough beyond their base, enough to cover anything beyond their basic needs. And yet every day she took calls from people demanding gifts or assistance. And often when there wasn't a referral they wanted, they, could, they would take it out on her. I could see as the season passed, she was getting more sad and frustrated. This type of thing can trigger an injury just like tripping or falling can trigger an injury and just like an injury we want to treat a triggering event in a particular way to minimize the impact on our body and our mind we're going to recommend a modified version of an age-old treatment for injury the rice method 
So everyone has probably heard of this acronym, RICE, R for rest, I for ice, C for compression, and E for elevation. And here's our modified version. So for rest, it's getting enough sleep and realizing that it's okay to sometimes do nothing. I know that seems kind of strange if you were born to raise that doing nothing means you're lazy, but there's actually a huge benefit to inviting nothingness into your life. We're going to talk about that more later. Ice, or in other words, chill. Um, I always like to look at bad days or bad moments as passing storms. Never in the history of this world has there been a storm that lasted forever. Like a storm, any moment will pass. Remembering that helps make it easier to not get carried away in the moment. As far as C, which is for compression, it means to reduce the volume of something. So reduce the volume of your obligations. Focus on drawing healthy boundaries that are manageable for you, but still help you meet your core obligations and elevate, choose more of the things you truly enjoy doing, lift yourself. We know we can't only do things we wanna do or the dishes would never get done, but it's okay to pick and choose between the things that fill you and the things that simply distract you. Is Facebook a filler or a distractor? What about dinner with your family? Focus and choose mostly things that fill. Number three, engage in some positive self-talk. Every one of us has an inner dialogue and usually it's not a very nice conversation for most of us. Start paying attention to the way that you think. When you notice you're replaying events in your mind over and over or worrying about things you can't control, acknowledge that your thoughts aren't productive. It's easy to get carried away with negative thoughts. Learn to recognize and replace thinking errors before they work you up into a complete frenzy. We're gonna try this exercise. Maybe not right now, but after we're done, write down some of the negative things you've thought about yourself or your circumstances today. And now take a moment to intentionally counteract those negative messages with positive truths in your life. These truths always exist and you just have to keep looking until you find them. Let's look at just a few examples. I know I've thought this, I'll never get better at this, I'm just not good at anything. But the truth that counteracts that is that I am capable. Humans are meant to learn, adapt and grow. And we're never too old to learn anything and anything that we've learned that isn't helpful or healthy can be unlearned. Another example is I'm such an idiot, I can't believe I made that mistake. And the truth is, is that it's only human to make mistakes. Mentally healthy people know that a mistake is not a reason to give up. Cultivating the courage to be imperfect is central to being willing to try again. Speaking of being imperfect, number four is to join the cult of the imperfect. So Sir Robert Alexander Watson Watt was a Scottish physicist credited with the development of radar in England during World War II. But when they started using it, it wasn't perfect. He justified his choice of a non-optimal frequency for his radar with his, not, with his often quoted cult of the imperfect, which he stated as, give them the third best to go on with. The second best comes too late and the best never comes. So how can you invite more imperfection into your life? One is to say no more and get rid of the haves twos and the should do's. If, there's no rule that says you need to do the holidays just like your mother. If gift giving has gotten out of control, consider doing something different. And don't let guilt control you. And if there's a tradition that's not working for you, just throw it out. Also lower your expectations. I know that I love watching Hallmark movies and they portray such as this perfect Christmas, but Real life isn't like that. And if you hold the expectation up here to like perfectly falling snow and sleigh rides and a crackling fire and a perfect meal, you're almost always going to fall short. And you have to accept that perfect is impossible. And part of that is because we're human. Again, those mistakes, but also everyone is different and everyone has different values. And so accept what's realistic and move on. Mistakes happen. Effective work is about moving toward the desired destination and not necessarily about ensuring that nothing gets spilled or knocked over in the process. Mistakes will happen, missteps will occur. It's momentum that matters and ensuring that time is not wasted, obsessing over the little things that won't end up moving the needle anyway. Number five, <clears throat> deck the halls with thoughtful lists. So I wanted to share something that I do when I feel like there's too many things going around in my head. I'm just swirling there like a tornado. I start with a download. I download my thoughts and write down everything that I'm worried about, whether it's tasks that need to be done or just things that I'm thinking over. And it gets it out of my head and into a space where I can look at it a little bit more objectively and they're not like running into each other like thoughts tend to in your brain. 
then I look at each thing and I think, what is the next thing I need to do to take care of this? And it could be something like send an email, or if it's something from home, it could be bring the laundry down. And then I prioritize those action items based on what's low hanging fruit and easily done right in that moment to just kind of minimize that list. But then things that have deadlines kind of float to the top that mean that these things need to be done now. And then things that have nothing to do with accomplishing important tasks suddenly become a little bit more apparent. Like it's okay if I don't dust the top of the refrigerator today. That might be something that's on my mind, but it's not actually gonna push me towards getting anything done that's important overall. Number six, step away from the tech. Advancing technologies will be both our savior and our doom. That was said by Olaf the Snowman in Frozen 2. If you haven't seen it yet, it's great. We enjoyed it. Chances are you're what the American Psychological Association calls a constant checker. According to the organization's annual report on stress, four out of five adults say they check their emails, texts, and social media accounts constantly or often. And when they researched 3,511 people over the age of 18, they found that stress runs higher among those who are glued to their gadgets. On a scale of one to 10, with 10 being a great deal of stress, the constant checkers rated their stress level as 5.3. On average, folks who engaged with tech less frequently reported 4.4. If you're a workaholic, happen to be kind of in that mind frame and constantly check your re or regularly read your work email, including on your weekends or days off, there's a higher overall stress level of six. 42% said they worried about negative effects of social media on their physical and mental health, while only 27% of the non-constant checkers shared that concern. So how do we do a little bit of detox from tech? I know a lot of us have a great desire to do that. I myself love to check my tech, um, but I found these rules doable. Um, delete all social media apps from your phone and just check them from a desktop computer. It actually makes it a little easier to not just reach through your phone and start scrolling. I did this one, turn all of your notifications off, um, except I think I left like uh, texting on for my kids, but it was really helpful to just not feel like I had to engage with my phone every time a notification popped up. Um, leave your phone in your pocket or keep it out of sight for anything involving other people, like a meeting, a get together, a conversation, or a meal. And that one's been really important uh, with my family, especially. Keep your phone out of sight during your commute. I work at my home which is great so I that's an easy one for me but it's probably a pretty good idea and then just don't take your phone with you into the bathroom number seven it's the most wonderful time of year to monotask so I have always kind of been proud of this idea of multitasking doing more than one thing at once but it turns out that what we call multitasking I think especially as women is really task switching and anything that averts your attention and focus causes a task switching episode. Now, although each of these episodes occur within a fraction of a second, research shows that these episodes can decrease productivity by 40% which really surprised me. Moving back and forth between several tasks actually wastes productivity because your attention is expended on the act of switching gears, plus you never get fully in the zone for either activity. So what we're really looking for is monotasking, and it's less about focusing in on just one goal and more about eliminating distractions that prevent you from accomplishing the one goal. So getting rid of that extra noise, I guess you could say. One suggestion that I found in some of these articles was to start your day by asking yourself two questions, and that would help you decide what the distractions were and what the focus was. What could I do today that will bring me a sense of meaning and purpose? And then what are the two most important things I can do today that would have the greatest impact? And that would help you focus in on what that one true goal is, and then be able to identify everything else as distractions. Number eight is breathe. And we're actually gonna watch just a quick video. I will cut it off a little short, but if I will make sure that you get a link if you wanna watch the whole thing about this wonderful therapist who's gonna teach us about breathing.
So if any of you were doing that with her, you could feel some of that breath coming in and out. And it's such a good thing to bring into your body. So speaking about things we bring into our body, let's talk about number nine, which is nourishing our bodies. Uh, look at that those Christmas treats and those ones look really amazing. My cookies never look like that. But Christmas treats are so great. And in a poll, up to 74% of respondents say that that's what that gets them through festive stress. But 60% also said they feel guilty about the way they eat during the holiday season. So that seems like a little bit of a battle. Instead of ramping up the aforementioned guilt in this one, I'm going to, and I won't be telling you what you shouldn't be doing, I'm going to actually tell you two new things instead. And one is why we love the sugary stuff so much. And the second one is actually what you can eat more of. So let's go check out this cute little monkey guy. So here's the deal. Millions and millions of years ago, apes survived on sugar-rich fruit. These animals evolved to like the riper fruit because it had a higher sugar content than unripe fruit, and it supplied more energy. Human bodies, like this one, kind of, learned to break this down into glucose and fructose, which triggered the body to store fat for a shortage that would inevitably come. This adaptation was a survival mechanism. Eat fructose and decrease the likelihood that you will starve to death. The sweet taste was adaptive in other ways too. In the brain, sugar stimulates the feel-good chemical of dopamine. Uh, this response makes sense since our hunter-gatherer ancestors like Fred there were predisposed to wanting to get hooked on sugar so that they could survive longer, store more. Now we have much easier access to these sweet foods. So the evolutionary wonder is now kind of working against us, but it kind of makes sense as to why it's there. We're seeking it out, trying to find something that will make us feel good and our bodies pick up on that stress and think, oh, I need to store more. So, but instead of focusing on what not to eat lists, which we have all seen and heard hundreds of times, and kind of comes back to that guilt thing, um, and we know them by heart, instead, I'm actually going to give you a list of some things that you can add to your diet that help decrease stress overall, that benefit your body in those ways. So one is milk. Another is oatmeal. I myself actually especially really like overnight oats, if you've ever tried those. Avocado if you can catch them when they're ripe. Bananas, berries, so good. Chocolate, which I knew would make everyone really happy. Darker the better. Um, citrus fruits. Tea, which for me is a really great, um, I, I just really like it as a way of relaxing. There's a lot of sensory involved with it. And then nuts. So here are examples of things you can actually add into your body. Just like we added in breath, let's add in some healthy foods into the things that we're eating. That'll just make it a little bit better for ourselves overall. <clears throat> just a few more. Number 10 is create negative space to do nothing. Hmm. So negative space is time set aside to do absolutely nothing. I myself am really bad at this. My husband is fantastic at it and he, in, a, in the very best way, and he is a good example for me of how to invite this kind of negative space in to regenerate our bodies. Now you can create negative time by setting clear boundaries for when your workday actually begins and when you're no longer available even by email and also setting boundaries for your family and friends about when you need time to yourself. You can also take just a few minutes every day to create some negative space in less than you know, five minutes while you're at work or home. One is just to take a moment and observe your body. Ask yourself, what am I feeling? Well, how do I feel from top to bottom? It's called a body scan, I've heard it called. You can think about how your feet feel on the floor or that hand or that tea, how it war feels warm in your hand, that coffee cup, and just think about how you're feeling. You can focus in on an object or a sound and keep your attention on it for a few minutes. It could be the sound of the bustle outside, um, the sound of nothingness in your backyard, or maybe you're looking at a tree or a cloud or even just focused in on a picture. And if you get distracted, just pull yourself back just a few minutes. And even just sending mentally send uh, some good vibes to someone and showing some compassion. There's also some useful ways you can use tech here. You can try a guided app. Um, the, the article that I read talked about smartphone programs like Headspace and Will. Um, they're free with like things you buy in the app. I use Headspace myself. 
turning up the tunes, dialing back stress with a mindful music playlist. You can make your own or one that I found that was recommended was Eckhart Tolle's Music to Quiet the Mind, which is free on Spotify. You can also find Zen on the web. I'm excited to find to try this one. You visit do nothing for two minutes.com. It's literally what it's called. And it displays an ocean landscape and plays audio of waves and crashing, which is a really relaxing sound for me, and instructs you to relax for a full two minutes. If you touch your mouse or press your keyboard, the timer resets. So those are some great ways to just kind of invite in some of the creation of that negative space. Number 11 along with that is to practice gratitude. Gratitude is a way for people to appreciate what they have instead of always reaching for something new in the hopes that will make them happier or thinking they can't feel satisfied until every physical and material need is met. I know that I totally get there. Gratitude helps people refocus on what they have instead of what they lack. And there are definitely some benefits. Um, there's an improvement in psych physical and psychological health, you can sleep better, you have better self-esteem, and it increases your mental strength, among other things. It's just a few of the benefits of inviting that thankfulness and gratefulness into your life. And here's a few ways that you can do it. You can write a thank you note to someone. Nobody really does that anymore, and I think there's benefit for you and for them. Keep a gratitude journal. Um, I actually saw something once where people call this jewels and joys, and it was just reflecting every day about little things that happen that make your made your day good. Um, count your blessings. And that's more of a longer one, I think. It's we do this as a family. Um, a lot of people do it Thanksgiving, but we took it a, an extra step and made a paper chain where we wrote something that we recognized as a blessing in our lives or something that was good in our lives, and then made a paper chain and tried to see how big we could get it to wrap around our house. If you're religious, a good way to, is to pray. It's a nice form of meditation and just meditating itself and finding some of that nothingness space. Gratitude can be very beneficial overall and really, again, invite in those great feelings. Number 12 and last, but certainly not least, is to LOL, literally. So there are, whether you knew it or not, some great benefits to adding laughter into your body and, or into your, uh, you know, increases oxygen in your body. It decreases hormones in the body, such as cortisol and adrenaline. And when we laugh, our bodies release endorphins. Laughter can reduce pain and support healing. And here are some ways to do that. Just read the funnies. Uh, befriend a funny person. Uh, spend time with family, which one isn't on here, but uh, my my son and his girlfriend actually just watched in who who as I waved at as they walked past. Um, have a favorite comedian. You can totally find stuff on Netflix and YouTube. Follow a funny sitcom. Everyone has one that they enjoy differently. Um, I know some of my kids like The Office, uh, Big Bang Theory. Um, I like Superstore, but maybe you have some of your own or ask someone who has some funny sitcoms and ask them what they like. Read a funny book. I'm looking for recommendations for this myself. I think the last funny book I read was like a Calvin and Hobbes collection. So if anybody has some recommendations, send them to me. Find a little kid you can hang out with. This is my little kid. Um, I mean, find a little kid, but not in a creepy way. But this is my niece. Her name is Rowan. She's three. And the thing that's great about hanging out with little kids is that they have no shame and they're super creative. And so they're hilarious. Um, and as you can see, like she just brings an enormous amount of laughter and joy into our lives. Um, some other things are playing fun games with friends. Apples to apples is great. We have a game we love called things. You probably all have games that you just love, but that interaction invites that in. Learn to laugh at yourself, which is looking for the funny side of things. When you're upset over something, ask yourself, how is this situation funny? Humor is a great way to deal with adversity and can even turn a negative into a positive. And last, do more of what makes you laugh. When was the last thing you, time you really had a good laugh? What are you doing? Well, do more of that. Makes sense to me. So just to review the 12 ways of Christmas to get through this holiday season as a helping professional is one, name your emotions, two, attend to your injuries, three, engage in some positive self-talk, four, join the cult of the imperfect, five, deck the halls with thoughtfulness, six, step away from the tech, 
Seven, it's the most wonderful time of the year to monotask. Eight, breathe. Nine, nourish your body. 10, create negative space. 11, practice gratitude. And 12, LOL, literally. I'm so glad that you enjoy, enjoyed us today. It was nice to have you with me. And if there's a survey that's going to pop up after this, and just remember, we'll be getting that recording to you with some links, and it'll be on our YouTube and through our social media. Have some happy holidays, and have a great day. Bye.